Hi everyone, this is Tina Ramirez and I'm very excited about being here with, with my friends from the Hill when I worked in the US Congress. We, so Andrea Martin and I helped co-found the International Religious Freedom Caucus in I think 2007, quite a while ago. And Julie Raymond was the first kind of, uh, she was the, um, the one that took over when Andrea went on to run, I think you ran the Congressional Black Caucus after that for Congressman Cleaver, is that right? Well, she, the Progressive Caucus after that. You've run everything and Julie <laughs> has run like a zillion caucuses. So we're gonna have a lot of fun and a lot of things to talk about and um, hopefully I can get my own name right. So anyway, moving on. Julie and Andrea, thank you so much for being here. And I'm just so grateful for the work we've been able to do over the years, but go ahead and you guys can introduce yourselves too. Thank you. I'm Andrea Martin, um, and I am a 28-year veteran of uh, the House of Representatives, and I have staffed the Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional Progressive Caucus. I've staffed a couple of members on the Judiciary Committee, the Financial Services Committee, and I'm currently the Legislative Director and Counsel for Congressman Andre Carson of Indianapolis. Uh, and I'm a Florida girl at heart and not a Hoosier, but I'm an honorary Hoosier. And I also work on interfaith issues, civil rights, separation of church and state issues. And, and it's wonderful to be reunited with my partner, uh, Tina, on some of these issues. Like partner in crime. You know? <laughs> yeah, and then I thought, that doesn't sound so great to talk about religious issues and crime. So I'll just say partner. And <laughs> well, we, you know, you are a survivor. 28 years, Andrea. I lasted four. And Julie, how about you? <laughs> Almost six. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> um. I worked for, for Congressman Heath Schuler for almost six years. Um, and Heath took the, the mantle of being the, the Democratic co-chair of the International Religious Freedom Caucus from Mr. Cleaver um, and, and carried it through for, um, I think also about six years before he retired. Um, and I was able to, to work with him on those issues and Tina and others um, and, feel very strongly that, that the work that we were able to do in that caucus was like the best work that I did as a staffer. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned so many lessons talking about caucuses um, from the Earth Caucus and about bipartisan mobilization and bringing people together um, that I now use at, at AJC. I'm the Senior Director for Policy and Political Affairs at the American Jewish Committee. And we work with caucuses all the time, um, from you know the Earth Caucus to caucuses that we're really intimately involved with, um, such as the Congressional Caucus on Black Jewish Relations, um, the Congressional Hellenic Israel Alliance, and the Bipartisan Task Force for Combating Anti-Semitism. Um, so I'm really excited to sort of go down this memory lane with you all um, and talk about the the issues that we're still facing together in this realm. Well, I think it's great for everybody to see just a, or to hear a little bit about, you know, how in the world did this get started all those years ago? How did people come together from different political and religious and other backgrounds and actually work together on something up there? And I know it happens more often than people think. And Andrea can share all about that. But um, I just thought we'd give them a sneak peek at one one aspect of it. So in 2006, actually, which is before I went up to the Hill, uh, Congressman Wolf had this great idea with these two new members of Congress, Trent Franks and Emmanuel Cleaver. Hey guys, we need a bipartisan working group on religious freedom. Will you do it? And so these two new members had no idea what they were getting into. But Andrea, you actually predated me because you I helped. Did. And I can tell you a story. You tell me the story. You start it. <laughs> it started with the Human Rights Caucus. And Tom Lantos was a co-chair of the Human Rights Caucus with Mr. Wolf. And they had such a wonderful bipartisan coalition. Um, and they, over the years, did hunger strikes for humanitarian issues. Um, but I think as Mr. Lantos got closer to retirement um, and things happened in the world, that they realized that they didn't want to divert 
so much attention away from some of the bread and butter work of the Human Rights Caucus. They really wanted to drill into international religious freedom, international human rights. So uh, Emmanuel Cleaver got a phone call one day from Tom Lantos. And for those of you who don't know who Tom Lantos is, he was uh, the only member of Congress who uh, was a Holocaust survivor. And Mrs. Lantos came to work with him every day with their little puppy. Um, and I remember walking from our office in Longworth. It was really like a random, may I speak with the congressman, please? And it was like, can you come over now? And we literally walked over to Mr. Lantos's office and sat and he was just such a heartwarming man. His spirit was everything you've heard about. And so he sat down with um, Congressman Cleaver and let me sit in the room and they're just chatting. He says, I've got a project for you. I know you're relatively new, but I need your help. I would like for you to help me with this project. And he talked about the Human Rights Caucus. And I think uh, Cleaver was already in uh, the Human Rights Caucus, but he said, I really need your help. And um, he said, we wanna start something bipartisan, totally bipartisan that brings members together and doesn't create more wedges. And I can remember Mrs. Lantos came in a little later and it turns out she had been in the Rayburn courtyard walking the puppy and came in and the little white, I can't remember the dog's name, but came in. But that's how it started. It was one of those, you get a phone call from Tom Lantos and you don't say no because he's Tom Lantos. Julie and I were just talking before we got started about Tom Lantos and just, you know, it, it was interesting because we were talking about bipartisanship and what's happening today. And we're like, you know, so much of that would never have happened because Tom Lantos was the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Yes. And I think when you go into a room where you're led by a Holocaust survivor yeah. who is fighting for the human rights of people, you are a lot more thoughtful Absolutely. about what you say and what you do and the respect you have for other people in the room. Yeah. And it's not to say that the Foreign Affairs Committee now isn't no. trying really hard to be bipartisan. It's just, you know, and they are, they are working to keep it bipartisan, but Absolutely. it is different. It is different. There was it's a, a hard act to follow. <laughs> yeah, there was a, there, people had a reverence around Tom Lantos that simply doesn't exist, not just in foreign affairs, but in Congress right now. I don't think there's anyone that sort of commands that in the same way, maybe with the cleaver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. and, right oh, as, as such like a such a minister of the of the members absolutely um, is and he was he was still a minister he was still actually pastoring every sunday when he started the caucus with congressman franks absolutely absolutely and tina has heard me tell the stories of me walking uh the congressman to the floor for votes and we have to come back to committee, you know, they'd recess committee for votes. And I'm like looking, waiting outside the cloakroom and, and going, sir, you know, it's your turn to ask the Fed Reserve chair a question. We gotta, okay, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. And instead of five minutes or 10 minutes, it'd be 20, 25 minutes. And I'd, I'd just look at him, sir, what happened? And he would just give me the look like, you know what happened and I can't tell you who it was, but he ended up getting buttonholed by a member, could be a D or an R and ended up doing pastoral work in the back of the chamber. Their there's souls needed a little bit of help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, good for him, you know, and I think he did end up, like his son took over his church eventually because it just became so much on the hill, but clearly his pastoral work never ended. <laughs> No. And I've talked to some of uh, my, my friends on staff with him and it's just like the open rite of passage. Yep. You're waiting in the hallway and you realize, okay, I just have to be patient. And it's good that some things never change. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we started in 2006, 2007 when I, um, you know, I joined you and it's just, it's grown and it's, it's been exciting to see it grow. But before we even go there, 
I just, you know, I was motivated. I came over from having worked at the commission on religious freedom and Trent Franks recruited me. He's like, you need to come and help me do this thing. And I'm like, okay. And religious freedom is really my life's passion. And I've never, I don't share it too often, but when I was, after my parents divorced, my dad actually became, became Jehovah's witness. And so for like the first 10 years of like, you know, from 11 to 21, we were in these major theological conversations growing up all through college, all through, you know, all through my teen years. And it really, it really, I think made me who I am today because I was very passionate about my own faith. And I felt like, you know, I love my dad. He has a right to believe what he, he believes. I have a right to believe what I believe. And I don't feel threatened by that, by, you know, his differences, you know, when I was a kid, I did. And then I realized there's no need to feel threatened. We can love each other and believe differently. And there's space for both of us. And I think that that was such a critical part of my own formation and, and wanting to, you know, begin to help people that were persecuted within my own faith. And then learning about this whole world out there of people that were suffering and realizing that, you know, this is a freedom that everybody should have. And it really, when you attack someone's freedom to believe, you really attack their dignity because it's what connects them to something outside of this world. And, you know, no one should take that away from us, the hope of something beyond this life. So that's what motivated me, but I would love to hear, you know, for you, Andrea and Julie, what, what motivated you? Well, I'm a, a child of the civil rights movement. Um, I integrated a school or two. Uh, my parents were um, active in the civil rights movement. So that was my childhood, hearing about incidents where, you know, an aunt was harassed or, I mean, this, I grew up in the deep South at the height of Jim Crow. So I've always been passionate about civil rights without necessarily knowing what I was passionate about, but I've also been passionate in integrating a large public high school with the benefits of diversity and understanding people that are other, that are different and looking for ways to find common ground. And I know that's a phrase that's near and dear to you, Tina, uh, about common ground, but um, I, I went to, to um, college and majored. I went to Duke and majored in history and political science and then came to Howard University School of Law, affectionately known as the home of social engineers. Um, and the tradition of people like Wiley Branton and Thurgood Marshall and Herbert O. Reed, who used to say, when it comes to civil rights, there's a no and a hell no, or a yes and a hell yes. And it, it turned out to be a natural fit that um, it, after spending a little time on K Street and not loving it, I um, ended up working for my hometown congresswoman from Jacksonville. and have stayed on for 28 years, but it really gave me the opportunity to help shape policy and protect civil rights, voting rights. Um, and religious rights have, I think, become even more important. Um, it was important working with Mr. Cleaver because he was asked to work on so many interfaith issues but the rubber has really hit the road for me in the last several years to bring my legal background into helping preserve rights, working for a double, triple minority. Uh, Andre Carson, who is a black Muslim. Um, and boy, the things I have learned about challenges to religious freedom domestically and internationally. So looking at what, what's happening with um, the Uyghur right now has really taken up a fair amount of, of our time. Or the Ahmadiyya um, in, in Pakistan. Um, there's so much work around the globe to do, uh, but it's, it's been a joy to be able to work on policy and shape policy, even as administrations come and go. The one thing I'll say, and then I'll, I'll shut up and let Julie talk is watching a small task force on international religious freedom grow out of the human rights caucus and watch the human rights caucus graduate from a voluntary congressional caucus to an institution now and the International Religious Freedom um, Commission institutionalized 
it's wonderful. It's really wonderful to see um, ideas grow, take root, and be so strong that they are an institution now that many people can rely on, notwithstanding one administration or another. So that's what motivated me. And I probably jumped down the list to kind of proudest moment, but um, it's what has made continuing to do the work so meaningful. Thank you, Andrea. And there's so much more we could talk about. We'll, we'll, sh- we'll save them for the cases. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because I, I mean, all of those things you shared were amazing. Julie? So uh, Andrea sounded so intentional and, and my path to the Earth Caucus was, I would say in, in many ways, much more accidental. Uh, I was working for Heath Schuler. Before that, I had worked only in Jewish communal organizations. So sort of in that kind of like faith-based world, working with college students and high school students and things like that. Um, and then I came to the Hill thinking this is gonna be a drastic shift. Like put all of that like mushy faith stuff aside. Like we're gonna get into the sausage making of policy and working for a Southern evangelical from North Carolina. I was like, okay, like the Jewish thing is really sidelined here. Like this is, this is not front and center anymore. Um, and, but then Mr. Cleaver talked to him and said, will you take over this role in the caucus? And he said, absolutely, of course. I don't remember exact words, but I imagine it said like, yes, sir. And then he came back to the office and he said to me, we're going to do this. And I said, we (laughs) come again, (laughs) we, and he said, this, this, you and I are going to do this together. And I was like, "Are, are you sure? And I sort of pushed him on it. Right. I said, like, you know, do you really want like your, your Jewish staffer in the, in this mix? And he said, that's exactly why. Because if anybody knows, if anybody comes from that historical background that understands the need for religious freedom and the the way that democratic values are threatened when religious freedom isn't upheld, it's the Jews. Um, and, And I said, okay, I'm in. And that not only started us down this road of really looking at the issues of, um, the leaguered minorities around the world, but also sort of hand in hand, looking at faith and each other's faith in a way that was really interesting, right? Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't think that Heath had had a lot of interaction with Jews before me. I may have been his first, um, you know, person that he was really close to who came from a Jewish background. Um, and, And likewise for me, you know, I was raised in Georgia, but not in that sort of you know, we didn't talk about faith a lot in the suburbs of Atlanta. Um, it wasn't part of the, the public school environment. Um, so while I'm sure that a lot of my friends growing up were sort of born again, evangelical types, like we just didn't discuss it. So I didn't know what that world looked like until Heath and I started having these conversations. Um, and so he and I grew, I think, a lot. And that growth sort of modeled or, or at least reflected the work that we were doing in the caucus. Um, and that's what I think is so amazing as we're talking about this, right? And the fact that the three of us together to talk about it is just so emblematic, right? That like, we're talking about the big issues, right? We can be talking about persecuted Christians or Uyghurs or Ahmadiyya or anti-Semitism or whatever the case may be, but we're really talking about people. And we're talking about those interpersonal relationships that drive that need for the advocacy, right? Like um, Cory Booker always says this and I love it and I quote him all the time. Change doesn't come from Washington, it comes to Washington. Right. The people that are driving it, they're moving the conversations and the Earth Caucus has done so much of that in like shining light on situations that you know, either aren't being reflected enough in the national media or aren't getting enough attention on the congressional agenda and really shining that light and saying what's happening needs to be addressed. Like we need to be paying attention. So cool. Totally agree. Yeah, with you. I can remember, um, and it may have been one of the first events that we did, but it was a reception in, I believe, the smaller foreign affairs room, and it might have been on the occasion of the first report Mm. that the commission did, and 
I can't remember what what uh, Reverend Congressman Cleaver said verbatim, but one of the points he made, I think, resonated so much with the members of the task force that were there then and the guests was his frustration that the Bible or any other holy book has been used more to do harm too often than to do good. And he, he, he shared an admonition that he hoped that the work that the group could do would be to make sure harm was not done in the name of religion. And I think that has permeated all of the work that's come forward since to be able to recognize whether it was, you know, Bosnia or India or wherever, that when someone uses their religious belief to hurt someone else, that's wrong. And he, he just boiled it down so simply that everybody in the room got it. And um, it, it was just a good starting point for how do you go on? Well, you try to do this. And it Give really it to a preacher. <laughs> You know, one of the, so when we started it, I remember one of the real motivations for both, both Mr. Lantos and Mr. Wolf was that, that the caucus would be bipartisan and multi-faith. Right. And even for people who didn't have any faith, but that it would be a caucus that really did widen that scope. Because I remember having worked at the Commission on Religious Freedom prior to that, that there was one group it was in the Senate. It was all conservatives and all evangelical. Mm -hmm. And I'm a conservative and I'm evangelical, but I respect all people. And I think that freedom of religion is best protected when it's for everyone. Right. That's been my life's mission. So Andrea, you and I worked really hard to, to everything that we did from the legislation that we first introduced on the Dalits in India to you know everything else after that on Sudan, on everything. Let's let's collaborate with other members, with diverse members. Let's get let's bring people together. I mean, the Ahmadiyas, I think they gave me an award for their like their second humanitarian award for helping their community in Lombok on an island in Indonesia because of how persecuted they were. Right. But I mean, that was like one of the oh, first sure. things that we did was like we traveled to these countries, we saw what was happening, and we helped people regardless of who they are, what they believed. And what a model for today. But anyway, so you mentioned a couple of countries that you are focused on that you love. And Andrea, I mean, and Julie, I'm sure you have some too. What are some of those key stories if you wanted to highlight like one that you really remember that kind of encapsulates what we did? Uh, for me, it's easy because there was, it was is multi-pronged advocacy. <laughs> um, when Heath and I first started, there was, um, it was around that time that persecuted Christians in Iran were really in the spotlight. And there was one pastor in particular that was just on the news every day, Pastor Yusuf Nader Kami. And he had been imprisoned for um, you know, sharing his faith, something like that. Um, but in typical Iranian fashion, like the regime, it just really like used him as the example and put him in the worst prisons and given him the worst condition and paraded it out for everyone to see. And this was at this point when um, like the Iran then wasn't the Iran that we know now, right? It wasn't this like existential debt to the region and the and the and the world. It was, you know, like another one of those countries that had a really bad human rights record. And this was just one other example. Right. Um, but the caucus went in and said, this is the case. And we did a letter after letter and interview on interviews on the news and resolutions and like every, you know, every tool in the congressional toolbox, we used it for Pastor Yusuf Madarkani. And it was a roller coaster because there would be a congressional letter, say, and then they'd release him. 
Right. And enough time would go by and then they'd imprison, imprison him again. And so then there'd be a round of interviews on the news stations for members of Congress. And then they'd release him and then they'd imprison him again. And I just looked it up before having this conversation because I was like, where is Pastor Youssef now? And of course, he is in prison again. Um, and, and I just imagine that he's been on this roller coaster since then. Um, but just being able to take that one life and that one example and dedicate all of that congressional energy towards it, it, it made a difference, right? Like I, I wish that the end result was so different and that I could say, you know, he's with his family and his son and they have a beautiful home and he's, you know, sharing his faith with everyone. Um, it's not that beautiful, but the fact that Congress was able to leverage all of these tools and all of these resources on his behalf was incredible. And that they came together for one person that they don't know, yeah. that they recognize that he deserves his freedom. Yeah. And you know, it's, it can be discouraging to be working in cases for years and years and years. And you're like, when is this going to end? But I was talking to a lawyer in Pakistan who'd been working on the case of Asia Bibi. And she was saying, Tina, it w I said, well, what was it that finally got Asia Bibi out of prison? And she said, it was really just persistence because I'm like, what was the trick? What did we need to do? Or what did we do that worked this time? Because it seemed like it was the exact same thing. Endless, endless. I mean, people died. It was horrible, but it was just the persistence. And so we never give up for any person. I think what strikes me the most isn't so much a specific case, just because names are escaping me, but the fact that to fill a void, this task force was formed to develop some expertise and some credibility and some neutrality and some respect in the Congress. Here's a group, here's a bipartisan group of members of different backgrounds or different stripes who want to work on these issues, whether it was in Sudan or Ethiopia or Pakistan or do you remember the N N Nepalese group Tina I can't remember that came in and visited us with a few times uh, it was Nepalese. it wasn't Nepal it was actually oh yeah it was like a little it was in India it was a little region of Other, India. yes that the, wanted um, their independence the Nagaland thank you them yes <laughs> no disrespect to that them. was pulling something out of a back the back of my brain Andrea. <laughs> no disrespect to them and their passionate advocates yes. I couldn't think of the name but they were very passionate I could never I I'd never heard of them before but they were so powerful with their advocacy but my point is that beyond the small group of folks in the task force in the caucus the work that they were able to accomplish, those letters, the attention, spotlights put on hard to resolve cases, they developed a reputation and an interest in the work that has grown way past the caucus per se. And maybe it's because I've worked with a few other caucuses, but the Black Caucus, the Progressive Caucus, even the Republican study group focuses occasionally on these issues. I think the, the result of some of the work was that we created space to be able to work on some of these human rights challenges, the tough ones. It, it's a little easier to look at rule of law and say, oh, you were jailed without a trial. But when it gets into to religious rights, it's, it's harder. And so the creation of, of, of space to bring in bigger groups, larger groups, so that it's no longer a specialty issue of one small group, of one dedicated group. Um, it's recognized now throughout the Congress that religious rights are human rights. And it took a little, I think, work to, to have that flourish without having to debate it or justify it. So if I had to fast forward and say, what's some of the fruit of that labor is that now you've got much larger groups willing to get behind a hard to solve problem without quite as much of the heavy lifting. There's still a lot of educating and just trying to grab people's uh, attention with the emails and phone calls because we're all overworked. 
to it. Um, it's it seems like it's 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 not easier to do, but it's not so impossible to do when we started. Well, and, and Vera, can I jump in really quickly? Because I yeah. just when you say that, it reminds me that daily groups were coming in to talk and it, you know, we're sort of talking about like the big picture, right? Like, oh, the Amadea, the Uyghurs, the, the people who are getting news attention, but there are so many groups out there that are fighting for any sort of attention and for them to be able to have an address in Congress that they know will be receptive is game changing, right? And we're talking about like, you know, the one person or that one tiny organization, all they need is somebody to shine that light. Exactly, exactly. Because they have powerful stories to tell. And the fact that it exists, that it was created and that it's, it's still there is such a testament to, they have a voice and that's what most people want. Most people in the world from the Naga people to, you know, the, the people on the little island of Lombok that were literally, uh, you know, the, the Ahmadiyya people that were just, they tried to be expelled. I mean, it was horrible what happened to them. Yeah. All of these communities that don't have a voice, they do. And I think that that's just such a beautiful testament to who we are as an American people and what we want for everybody else. We just want them to be able to live with the same kind of freedom. And, and I think that it was great to be a part of that and to see it continue. And, you know, I think that this is just proof of what can happen when you, you you really see the humanity in others and you want to work towards that common goal. So the, the other thing that was unique about Mr. Lantos that is different in this point in time, and he was a product of, of his generation, the greatest generation, but he would talk to individual members. And one of the challenges we face now is that people talk at each other. Mm -hmm. They don't talk directly to each other, um, whether it's a phone call or whether it's, God forbid, a conversation in the hallway. That's been a little tough during the pandemic, but um, it, it really does make, make a difference, I think, in the ability to talk to people and learn about something that's different that you think you know, but you really don't, and to have a dialogue not a debate to score points not you know a um, gotcha moment with a with with a camera rolling and I think if we had chances for more maybe off the record conversations or dialogues debate is where you're talking to score points mm -hmm. dialogue is listening to learn and I I hope we we have more opportunities for that in um, advancing some of the work that the that the commission is, is thank God still plotting away on. So Andrea, before we leave, is it is it still possible? Is the work of the caucus, this bipartisan work, is it is it you know in this political climate, is it still possible? Yeah, you're still there. So yep, yep. My old boss um, bef before Mr. Cleaver was is uh, Mr. Clyburn. And he loves throwing around the state motto of South Carolina. And I'm, I'm probably going to butcher the Latin, but the gist of it is, as I breathe, I hope. Mm. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's when you, when you give up hope, you just need to just turn the lights out and put your head down on your desk. <laughs> and sometimes you just need to do that to refresh. I was going to say, I did that four times today. <laughs> But yeah, I'm hopeful, Tina. I'm hopeful. Okay, good. Well, I'm hopeful too. And I think, I mean, that's, you know, when people are, are struggling around the rest of the world and being persecuted, it's their faith that gives them hope. Absolutely. And that's, and that's what we defend for them. We don't want, we don't want that light of hope to go out anywhere in the world. And I don't think people understand it is your lifeblood. So, yeah. So we all will continue standing for it. Andrea, Julie, thank you. Thank, Thank you, Tina. Thanks, Julie. Nice to meet you. Alrighty. Great to see you both. Thank you so much.